Hello, everyone. This is John Yuva, Editor for Supply and Demand Chain Executive in Food Logistics. Welcome to today's educational webinar, Predictive Analytics 1. This is SDCE's fifth educational webinar for 2018. Speaker and registration info on our remaining events are available on SDCE's website at www.sdcexec.com slash webinars. We have three expert panelists today to lead our discussion on predictive analytics and how it's generating value for supply chains. Camila Gomez, PhD, Senior Vice President, Quantitative Research for Credit Risk Monitor, Vivek Sanasia, Global Head of Supply Chain Solutions for Anaplan, and Brian Begeman, Leader at John Galt Solutions. Our educational webinars are interactive, roundtable discussions with only a handful of slides. We encourage the audience to submit questions during the hour, which I'll pitch to our panelists. To join this conversation, simply submit your questions and comments using the console, and I'll get to as many of them as possible. Please indicate if there's a particular panelist you want to address when you submit your question. Finally, we have a limited number of slides today, but if you need to refresh your viewer, just hit the F5 key. Finally, our editorial staff will be live tweeting throughout the hour. You can follow the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at SDC. I'm sorry, at SDC Exec and hashtag SDC Live. Today's panelists are veterans in the predictive analytics sector and represent some of the leading providers in this space. We'll start with each panelist providing an overview of key trends and developments in the sector, then we'll use the rest of the hour to address questions from the audience. And with that, Camilla, I'll start with you by defining predictive analytics and why it's important for supply chain professionals. Thank you, John. Um, glad to be uh, joining this presentation here. Uh, supply chain executives have a tough job, uh, you know, managing the risk of their uh, suppliers uh, can be global and can represent a broad range of uh, companies that uh, you have to deal with. So predictive analytics is really a, a tool or a set of tools that in essence help you handicap uh, future events. Uh, that helps you identify the risk that uh, a certain events that may disrupt your supply chain can happen uh, over, a few, uh, over a period of time. Uh, ideally, these types of tools should give you enough lead time so that when you do identify a high-risk situation or a high-risk vendor, you have time to mitigate that. Uh, if, if, you, if that time window gets narrowed significantly, uh, it, while it's still predictive, it's not as useful as uh, otherwise. The other thing, of course, is that there should be enough granularity in the types of uh, predictions so that you can choose to take different actions depending on the level of risk. So just because a company is high risk doesn't mean that it may be an immediate risk, uh, while others might be high risk and you should be taking uh, immediate action uh, for doing this. One of the types of problems that, uh, and, and, and that we're very much involved in at a credit risk monitor is financial distress. So from a supply chain point of view, it's really the, a, a major vendor filing for bankruptcy. Uh, and now that's really the most distant event. A more likely event, of course, is having a vendor go into financial distress. And the impact that has on the supply chain is that you start having delivery problems, operational problems, uh, long before financial distress or bankruptcy uh, happens. A credit risk monitor, we take a, a view, we cover both public and private companies, we take a top-down approach. For example, one of the things that can be developed is a picture to start off with the risk of the particular industry that you're dealing with uh, with your vendors. If the industry as a whole is, for example, high risk, that kind of colors all of your vendors, even though the individual vendor itself may be of lower risk uh, or may seem uh, of lower risk. An example of this is, for example, the water transportation industry. And if you go to our website, we offer something called the Frisk Stress Index, which is 
derived actually of the Frisk score, which I'll talk about in a minute, as an example of a predictive analytic solution. That gives you a quick picture at the industry level of what the risk associated with that industry is. And you can see that for, if you were to look on our website, for uh, the water uh, transportation industry, it, the risk has been elevated over many years. And that has to do with a lot of uh, oversupply of ships, basically, uh, from uh, since the last recession. And they're still working that out. And you can see that the trend has been uh, decreasing. So once you have an understanding of the risk associated with the individual industry, then you want to really start to understand the risk associated with the particular company, the vendor you're dealing with. Uh, and there, there's a number of solu uh, solutions available depending on the type of vendor you're dealing with. If it's a large public company, there's a lot of information available uh, about public companies that can help you uh, evaluate the, the risk uh, of that uh, uh, business. Uh, our first score is one of those proprietary models that we offer as part of our service. And it combines a number of types of data. It combines stock market information, which at first thought, you, 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 may, you, know, you may not think of it as the first thing that gives you information in terms of the financial health of the company, but it does because common shareholders are the last ones to get paid if the company is uh, dissolved. So they are very keen in understanding the uh, financial health uh, of the company. It's been a lot of work done uh, showing that there is a very strong relationship between stock market performance and uh, bankruptcy risk as well as just the risk of financial distress uh, overall. The second type of data that we incorporate is financial statements, which are really more the traditional source of data for uh, credit analysis or financial health analysis. And um, we provide that and we look at the, over the last several years, how the financial statements have been uh, performing. The third piece of data is we track agency ratings, and uh, we find that agency ratings are also very predictive, even though they're developed for the purpose of bond default and bond pricing. We find that they're also very informative in terms of predicting financial distress, as in uh, bankruptcy. And then the fourth piece, which is uh, first incorporated into the first score, is uh, what we call a, the crowdsourcing of our subscribers. Uh, our subscribers are the individuals who are responsible for the business-to-business -business transactions, like yourselves. And, you know, you know they belong to some fairly large companies. So their actions matter. And in many cases, the knowledge that they have about a vendor or a client uh, may not be fully reflected in the publicly available information uh, out there. What we've been able to identify is that how our subscribers use our own website is very indicative of the level of concern they have about such companies. And so we capture that, and we've been able to incorporate it into uh, the Frisk score. The, the score itself is a bankruptcy probability, and the reason we look at bankruptcy is because that is a very clear and public event. Bond defaults can happen for a lot of reasons, and uh, if there is a bond default, there may not be any impact on the uh, supply chain, on their ability to meet their commitments. But if there is a bankruptcy, there's a very big impact uh, on that. So. The way we do it, and uh, John's put the um, slide of what the first score looks like on uh, on our on our on the site. Um, it's a score from one to ten. 
1 to 5 being high risk and 6 to 10 being uh, below average risk. And as the higher, the higher scores imply a lower risk uh, of bankruptcy. Each score value is associated with a specific range of bankruptcy uh, over the next 12 months. Uh, so uh, you, you can see that the, the 10 bucket has a very small uh, range of bankruptcies, basically less than 12 basis points or 12 one hundredth of a percent. Well, if you go down, risk five is a special category because that's usually where the average bankruptcy risk is. For public companies, that's about 1%. So that's bracketed by that range. And as you go down further, the increasing risk in bankruptcy is larger as you go down to lower and lower buckets, getting down to a fiscal one, which is our, our highest category, which shows a bankruptcy risk of about 10% to up to 50%. So we provide this, for example, on a daily basis. Uh, using information from the stock market allows us to update our risk assessment daily, where using information from financial statements alone would give you uh, only an update once a quarter. So for example, we were talking about the water transportation industry. And one is one uh, recent bankruptcy that happened this past spring is Rand Logistics, which is a shipping company. And uh, with that, that company was in the debt in the red zone for a very long period of time, over about 12 months. Uh, it was a three, and then it went down to a two, and then it went down to a one. Uh, about four months before it actually filed for uh, bankruptcy. So with that information, you can use that to set up certain specific events. As soon as you see it getting into the red zone, you can start taking specific actions to A, understand why it's in the red zone, and B, what other actions can be taken to, to mitigate that uh, exposure. That's hey, Camilla, what, the picture what are some, for. What are some? Yes. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, the the that, that's the picture really for for public companies. Uh, the uh, for private companies, you have a much more limited set of data uh, available to to uh, to use to kind of evaluate the risk of uh, financial distress. Uh, if you can get financial statements. You can, of course, run them through models like the Frisk score that use the financial statement data to produce that kind of uh, risk assessment. But in many cases, you're not going to have that. Uh, in many cases, what you end up using is uh, payment information, uh, information that is aggregated by companies like ours. Uh, our subscribers have the option of providing us with their companies accounts receivable data, which tells us how their clients are paying them, uh, by the way, they're current, uh, as agreed upon, 30 days past due, 60 days past due, so on and so forth. And for private companies, we find that that's very informative. Uh, and we've developed a model that we just launched, the pay score, that also looks at the risk of bankruptcy for private companies over the 12 month period of time. And it's in a scale, it's very similar to the first score, one to 10, one to five B, high risk, uh, and the lower, buck, the, the lower score values being much significantly higher risk. Uh, we find that it's not as accurate as the first score. The first score has a 96% accuracy rate. In other words, it captures during our development phase, 96% uh, of all bankruptcies, they gave us a sufficiently early warning. With the pay score, that percentage goes down to 70, 75%. So it's a little less uh, predictive, but it is still very effective in helping you uh, 
identify those high-risk companies. So with that, I'd like to hand it back to you, to you John. Thank you very much, Camillo. Um, how do you see predictive analytics evolving in the future uh, in the financial area? Well, you know, there's a lot of new sources of data. Crowdsourcing is one example. So we're going to be using more of that. Uh, natural language processing is another one. Uh, from the point of view of, of financial risk assessment, there's a lot of information, earnings calls, uh, SEC reports, uh, where the information isn't numerically available, but it's in text form. And a lot of the uh, artificial intelligence techniques that are, you know, have been developing over years are now getting to the point where they're very effective in being able to extract that information in an automated fashion and turn it into something that can be quantified. Uh, and so one of the things that I think people can expect in the next several years is to see more of that type of data being incorporated into these uh, financial models. All right, well, thank you, Camillo. We're now going to move on to Vivek, who will be discussing the role of data science in predictive analytics. Thanks. So, um, you know, I, what we are doing at Anaplan and what I've done over the years in my career is focused a lot on supply chain planning as a process. And uh, the methods that we have traditionally used in supply chain planning over the years have all been sort of history-based predictions, meaning looking at the past and predicting the future based on a handful of parameters. Uh, if you're trying to forecast sales, you will look at previous history and forecast sales based on that, make adjustments, which is primarily manual adjustments uh, based on sales folks, people putting in their own intelligence about their customers or markets or some other things that uh, you, know, you, don't, you, you know intuitively, but not necessarily predicted by data. Those planning methods that are being deployed and used for more than two decades now are dramatically transforming with the advent of uh, what is commonly known as big data. Um, lots of external data about what's going to happen in the market in this day and age is now available to be consumed and then processed to then predict what's really gonna happen in the market and how do you then plan your supply chain processes, whether it's um, sales or distribution or logistics or fulfillment, how much to do what, where, how much inventory to keep where and so forth based on those predictions. So that's really what uh, I believe has reached an in inception point really at this point where these old methods are on their way out and new predictive methods are on their way in. And predictive methods consume tremendous amount of data. For example, you know, Walmart alone handles more than a million customer transactions every hour um, and imports those into databases. Many of Walmart's customers have had access to some of that information, but m many of them have not been able to use it up until very recently to, to, to predict how much of their product is gonna sell in Walmart. But that capability is now becoming available and real. And uh, folks are starting to use that as an input. You know, there's tremendous amount of data, for example, also available in uh, RFID tags that retailers use, which is also a change from the conventional barcode system. So there's, um, hundred and thousand times of data available of all the product movements, what's been received, what's been shipped, what's in inventory, how quickly it's moving, what's on trucks and so forth. And, and that data is available to then use for predictions and then drive and execute your supply chain based on that data. Similarly, many other sources of data that are available, whether it's social media, you all are familiar with Facebook, you know, handling more than 200 and 50 million photo uploads and 800 or more active, 800 million active users putting their opinions or 
or information about products that they're buying, selling, or liking, or not liking. Um, you know, five billion people all over the world, texting, calling, tweeting, all that data is available. And it's a matter of using that data to pump it into the predictive analytics algorithms and coming out with accurate predictions. So that's where the role of data management is dramatically changing in supply chain planning functions. You know, it used to be, we used to have an old process, say as an operations planning process, planners would run some statistical algorithms to predict what, what they're gonna do. They would have consensus forecasts and then you would drive the supply chain based on that so-called consensus forecast, which is essentially viewed as gospel, but the reality is in the volatile markets of today, uh, things are always changing on you. And if you're connected to the market in real time by being able to consume all that data that's out there and then being able to adjust your plans and effectively, more effectively execute in your supply chain, you know, you have tremendous amount of value that you can derive out of those predictive analytics. And that's really what's happening as we speak. So the role of data management is going to be huge in years to come. Um, because of the nature of the data. And there is, uh, when it comes to managing data, I like to, we have a thing called four V's, volume, variety, velocity, and veracity of data. Uh, goes without saying, uh, volume is going through the roof. Uh, sizes of data that are being processed every second range from terabytes to petabytes. Variety, uh, as you can imagine, it's no longer some you know, standard feeds of data in a structured format from coming in from many sources. It's uh, structured and unstructured. It's text, it's sound, it's video, it's multimedia. Uh, it's Miller rooted to um, natural language processing. So there's all kinds of data that has to be, uh, and a variety of that data that has to be processed. And then the velocity of data. It's so much and it's coming in so fast that uh, it's no longer offline, it's streaming, it's real time. It is uh, something that is analyzed the moment it comes in. Uh, there is very little lag between the time the data is received and then it's pumped into the analytical algorithms. And the veracity, which is uh, quality and correctness and accuracy of that data. So when you really think about it, if you your organization want to use predictive analytics for supply chain planning, the role of data management and data science is really going to be much more elevated than it has been ever before. So data managers or data management folks would be able to manipulate, manage structure, unstructured data at very fast velocity. And the scientists, the data scientists are the guys who then figure out what the right predictive algorithms are based on what you're trying to accomplish or predict. And uh, those are very high skilled and complex jobs. And uh, those have been sort of in the back office or not so visible in the past. But now these folks are be, will be in the front, uh, front row in decision-making when it comes to business decisions and um, validating or proving out those predictions for executives to make decisions on. So um, that role is definitely becoming a very, very critical role in the organization. And then, uh, of course, you know we're seeing artificial intelligence as a broad umbrella taking a a broad role in executive level decision making, tactical level decision making, day to day decision making, and um, the discipline of machine learning by itself. Uh, which is a machine that's constantly consuming all that data, constantly predicting what's going to happen and learning from what's really going on based on what happened in the past and what um, trends that uh, are derived from those external data. Um, that becomes a key source for all types of supply chain planning decisions. So those are big drivers of the disruptions that are currently going on in the market and internal changes that organizations are going through to be able to harness the value that comes from predictive analytics.
So if you could go to that slide um, that talks a little bit about where we are now starting to see um, the use of predictive analytics on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I think that would be slide six. Um, you know, these are uh, some of the common use cases that we're seeing um, where um, you know, organizations are starting to leverage predictive analytics. Um, one use case is demand sensing. So if we can sense what's going on in the market by capturing all that data that's out there, whether it's retailer data, consumer data, micro macroeconomic data, any other market uh, behavior based data, you can use that data to sense what's going on in the marketplace and then respond in your supply chain to to um, for, to basically um, respond to that prediction that's coming out of it. Another common area that we're seeing predictive analytics being utilized very heavily is in predictive maintenance, especially in asset intensive industries that are starting to get a lot of data now from sensors and IoT devices. So the machines predictive, machines failures are predicted much better than ever before. Think about, um, you know, um, spare parts that are needed to, um, to um, or for an aircraft or for a, um, for an asset that's out in a mine or even oil and gas industry, all the you know, drilling equipment, you know, when every minute of preventing downtime in these asset intensive industries is big value in dollars. So lots of folks are now starting to use the new, newly available data, which is coming from the actual machines themselves, especially when they're putting sensors in different parts of those machines. And that's changing the game of how maintenance in these assets is conducted. Another area that we're seeing a lot of utilization is in uh, predicting profitable launches of new products. Um, most folks, when they develop products, don't really have a view of how that product is going to sell. But by analyzing the attributes of a product and the market characteristics and what the consumers may be looking for or what, or what they're likely to do, that gives you much more accuracy in predicting how well those products are going to do in the market. And then you can uh, put in the right uh, plans behind it. Another area we're seeing is trade promotions. It has always been a black box. You know, folks never really understood when you run promotions, how much true demand uplift you get. Uh, but uh, with the ability to analyze a lot of data and predict, you can understand the cause and effect relationship between promotions and the actual demand uplift. And you can, uh, you know, optimize your promotion spend and so forth. Um, similarly, reducing inventory and working capital. Um, this is a, always a moving target. And uh, if you're now able to sense what's going on in the market, you can also plan how much to invest in your inventory and working capital across the entire supply chain and different echelons of your supply chain. And that definitely helps you to, um, to do a much better job leveraging predictive analytics as to how to manage your inventory. Um, similarly, other scenarios like supply planning, when you're trying to come up with the right response from a production, procurement, or manufacturing asset utilization standpoint, you can come up with better supply plans based on predictive analytics. Price optimization to maximize profitability is another one of those situations where you can understand the impact of how sensitive price is in its relationship with demand. And once you're able to do that, you can predict by increasing price or decreasing price, how much uh, you can orchestrate demand. Um, and of course, going back all the way into production shops and manufacturing locations and factories, day-to-day um, -day production decisions like optimizing utilization of your machines, or work centers or minimizing bottlenecks and maximizing throughput to your factory by understanding all the drivers of throughput and demand, you can manage your manufacturing much more effectively than ever before. So these are uh, some things that we're working on actively right now to help clients solve for many problems that they have not been able to solve in the past. 
uh, and at the same time, leveraging predictive analytics to do a much better job in these scenarios and in these use cases to then create tremendous amount of value in the organization. And this is just the beginning. The, the same ideas could be applied in your entire supply chain, all the way from um, procurement to distribution to logistics to customer service to aftermarket and anywhere else in between. And uh, you can find, you know, by leveraging predictive analytics, you can make tremendous changes and improvements and transformations really in your entire supply chain. And that's really where the future is. Uh, I think the future supply chain is gonna be more and more predictive analytics driven than anything else. And that's the biggest disruptor that's going on in the market at the moment. I'll, I'll stop here, John, if you wanna um, move over or have questions. Right, thank you, Vivek. I'll now turn the event over to our third presenter, Brian. Brian, who will be, uh, be providing real life examples of challenges and benefits of using predictive analytics. Brian? Great, thank you, John, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Camilo and Vivek for the information. Uh, very informative. Here at John Galt, we're, we're hearing about this stuff every day. I mean, definitely in the market, in the predictive market, uh, it's really grown over the last 20 years and, and especially lately. Um, we talk to our, um, we like to talk about, uh, so we like to talk about how our customers are currently using predictive analytics and, and a lot of the, some of the challenges that they might, they might be facing and they have faced. So, uh, predictive analytics can sometimes be a little harder to implement than the normal process that we have. But as we've been hearing, there are a lot of great results that can come of it and it can really help us out. So, one of the ones that people talk a lot about is um, demand sensing. And really with that, that is bringing in real or near real-time data to help us understand what's happening in the marketplace. So not just POS information or shipment information, but other factors that will, that will drive the business. Weather is a uh, key example uh, that we hear people hear a lot about. Uh, John, if you can go to slide uh, slide seven there. Um, but so, for instance, this past year, April was one of the worst months, uh, worst April that has happened in, in years. And for one, or I wouldn't depend on what you consider worst. So it was one of the coldest months that we've we've had in years. And for one of our customers uh, who they sell, you know, winter products, it was very important to get that information and be able to react quickly and realizing that April was not going to be the past April and being able to adjust to that and build more product and so that they could have it out in the marketplace. Versus another one of our customers, they sell ice, they're preparing for the summer, and it doesn't hit. It's actually still the winter. And so their their demand is really low. So and then with that, we really didn't even have much of a a winter. It went or a, a spring. It went from winter to summer in a week. So being able to have that information is crucial, and it allowed customers to adapt quickly to that. But some of the challenges is 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 getting that information and having the system that can one take in, in in that information all the time. It's not so something that you can load once in a while. It's constantly changing, and you want to have that information coming in to your system all the time and trying to get that information. Right, and then there's not just having that information. Weather is an example. Sometimes you have to massage the data that you do have. So one of the, with uh, the ice company, the weather data, it's actually not the temperature that drives the business. It's the difference of the temperature versus the average temperature for the last 15 years. That really is the big, is really what drives their business. So it's not just getting the data, but then it's also maybe even manipulating that data before it even comes into the machine learning and doing more things with the data to get that a more accurate picture of what's going on. But that, so 
other things, uh, as we, we've heard, you know, how do we, it's going to help us reduce inventory and working capital. So, and looking at bringing in other factors that are going to, going to drive that. So for one of our customers that are doing daily planning for distribution, you know, they've been able to automate that process. So, but one of their challenges was actually that a lot of what they do with machine learning is kind of a black box. And we are turning over, instead of having sales drive the business or people out in the field, they're just looking at, here's what, what should happen, and this is what we're going to do because we're automated. So there was a big, to move into this process of this automation and let the machine, so to speak, drive the business, it was a lot of selling to the organization that this is going to provide more value and you need to trust the numbers and work with the numbers. And then when it doesn't work out, let's communicate and find what the problem is so that we can improve improve the model and improve the other data that we need to bring into the tool. But that actual relationship with the people out there to let them know that this is, uh, that it's not just a, it's a black box, but it's going to give us better results, makes it, uh, that was definitely a challenge for a lot of, a lot of people. As an example, for the ICE company, they had to, uh, they figured out that they can have their inventory really low for the customer and still reduce their stock outs. They, you know, when they implemented it, the stock outs uh, really improved at the customer and they could have their inventory really low. But the customer complained about it. They said it was too low. It didn't look good. They didn't feel comfortable. So even though that they could keep their inventory at a really low level, the end user customer felt uncomfortable so that they had to change some of the, the math so that it actually gave a higher uh, stocking level so that the customer felt more comfortable. So the, the concept of uh, there's a lot of opportunity here, but again, it's, it's, uh, you have to work. It's still about people and making sure they're comfortable with them. And then using the people that you have in, in the, in the organization to continually improve this, right? So um, some of the other situations around transportation is uh, for uh, American Red Cross, they only have so much supply. So a lot of what they had to do is they had a constrained supply. So taking into account, this is all we have and how do we allocate that out to where we're going to need it is really, it was a really important thing. So one of the other things that uh, has worked really well for a number of our customers is looking at customer segmentation and looking at how you can, uh, you want to grow your business by looking at the customer's and going to where the money is, right? So um, sometimes, uh, for instance, it might not make sense to go to this customer because of where they're at, or or, or the or um, you know how much how much the cost is going to be to go to that customer. But you but because of maybe that customer is growing, for instance, Dollar General is a customer that's growing. Uh, you might need to treat them differently and change what you normally would have done, but because of you've looked at your business and you're going to your customer segmentation and look at customers in a different way, you need to change your math so that you're going to treat those customers with a little more priority than you normally would have because of other factors that are going to go in. So looking at the customer segmentation and how you want to approach that is, is, a, is really important. As I mentioned, a lot of implementing this and the challenges that customers have faced, one is, you know, bringing in the data and getting it uh, all the time, but a lot of it is that personal relationships. We talked about that. It's, it's kind of a black box, and sometimes people are really uncomfortable with giving up the control. But we have seen 
that if you can convince them and talk to them, they're going to and show them that there's going to be great results and so that they will give up that control, in, incredible results. And we have a, a few up here. One of the, again, just as another example of a customer that, you know, they were allowing the system to, to drive their orders from a customer. And sales had trouble because sales had trouble because they were t they were telling the customer that to not buy product. So here you have the sale. You're you're telling the customer not to buy the product, but then sales is saying what is going on. And so there's that their internal struggle of that again the the, the black box and allowing the machine to run. So that personal relationships um, within the organization and, and moving this direction is is one of the big big challenges that we've seen. But again, if you can work through that the results that you're going to get from it are, uh, are amazing. And just to kind of wrap this up, when you, think about, when you think about this in predictive analytics, it really is a journey. It's not something you can just turn on and work with. Um, users that look at, users are going to work on analyzing the results and improving the process. So uh, just some of the results, um, what I found amazing was working with one of our customers, uh, specifically the ICE customer, is when they started and they said, we're going to do automation and we're going to let, let the tool drive the business and let machine learning handle it all. When they first started to turn it on, they got a 50% reduction in customer out of stocks. It was amazing. But then they didn't stop there. They kept working through it. They had a lot of things that they had to deal with, again, those personal relationships. But over another two years went by, they got a 75% reduction in unnecessary deliveries. And then another year, they saw a year-over-year -year increase of a 20% productivity. But there were a lot of challenges along the way of how to get there, and a lot of it had to do with the personal relationships with either the customer, internal, with people who are out in the field, and now people giving up control. But when you can do that, it it has a, a tremendous amount of value, and we're going to see that this more around uh, automation and more around letting the machine make the decisions. And our job as the supply planners and the the um, the, the people in the field is to find out how we can make it better, right? How we can find the areas where we can use it more and allow the systems to move forward. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Brian. We're now going to transition into our Q&A portion of the event. Um, our first question is for Camillo. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the Frisk score and how does it forecast problems in ind industries such as transportation? Yeah, the, the, the first score, as I said uh, before, and as uh, Vivek was mentioning in terms of uh, developing predictive analytics, actually based on looking at historical data. Uh, we, we, we look back many years over, ideally over a business cycle, uh, and identify those companies that have uh, been successful or have been uh, uh, failures. And uh, we train the factors to to the model basically just identify those key factors that are predictive for the, in, in our case, uh, bankruptcy. The way that uh, industry, for example, uh, goes into the model is actually through the stock market uh, component. The stock market, it turns out, is very good at differentiating uh, the effects uh, <clears throat> or the nuances of different industries. So we find that uh, the overall movement, uh, stock movement of any particular company is largely driven, A, first by the industry they're in, and secondly, by the specific conditions uh, of the company. All right, thank you. Let's see, Brian, um, what is the difference between machine learning and expert selection and forecasting? Sure. Uh, expert selection, uh, uh, those are methods that have been used for a very long time in helping users understand, you know, essentially 
provide a forecast for us and picking the best statistical method that we would use to, to drive the forecast. You know, whether it was a whole winners or a, a, maybe a simple exponential smoothing. But with machine learning, even though we're still working on getting a forecast, we're bringing in other information. As we've talked about, what else could possibly drive? We mentioned the weather example. There could be social information around how my product is doing on Facebook. There could be um, other information around the um, the consumer index or maybe just how the housing market is doing. Other factors on, on future on, on where things are going. Uh, there's a lot of information out there that is predicting here's where we think that here's where things are going and bringing that in to help generate that future forecast. And with machine learning, there's a lot of algorithms that are, are that can be used. Um, but the big thing is bringing in a tremendous amount of other data to help compute that future future decision of what you're going to do and give you a, a better result. All right, thank you. Uh, Vivek, are many companies using machine learning in day-to-day -day sales and operational planning decisions, or is it a more of a future view? It's a great question, actually. So these newer predictive methods in artificial intelligence as a discipline and machine learning as a discipline is still emerging. <laughs> Is it operationally deployed for day-to-day -day planning or in sales and operations planning cycles? There's only a handful of leading edge organizations at the moment who are utilizing that. And not also those who are working on it are not solely utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning as a predictive method. The traditional methods, the statistical method that Brian was alluding to are also key inputs and segmentation key inputs. Uh, but the reality of the situation is that in the very near term, when I say that, it, I'm thinking year or two years, uh, those who are already using it will gain more and more confidence in the predictions that are coming out of these machine learning algorithms or other methods. And uh, very soon they will start to rely on those things, uh, on those predictions to make decisions at all levels. Um, to my knowledge, most organizations are in, those progressive organizations are in this transitional states. Others who are sort of behind the curve, they're experimenting, they're doing proof of concepts, learning from these. And uh, I would say majority at the moment are still contemplating how to use it and figure it out. So that's basically the state of the market at the moment from what I'm seeing. All right, thank you, Vivek. Camillo, uh, what is the difference between the Z-score and the Frisk score? Well, the, the, the Z-score is, uh, is a uh, bankruptcy score or risk uh, model that was developed actually back in the 70s by Professor Ed Altman. And it basically is driven completely from uh, financial statement information. Uh, which is the classical technique for, you know, financial risk analysis. Uh, the, 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 the Frisk score uses some of the inputs of the Z-score, but in addition uses a lot of other information, like stock market information, uh, agency ratings, uh, crowdsourcing. And it's one that, you know, we, we build and we constantly monitor the performance of over time. One of the things that uh, happens with many of these techniques is that they do age over time. As soon as you build them with a given data set, they tend to uh, age and degrade uh, in performance, unless, of course, you build in uh, an automatic update mechanism that looks at current performance, takes in the latest amount of data, crunches it, and updates that. But uh, what we do is uh, we monitor the performance of these systems and we periodically update them uh, to do that. So one of the differences is, is that it's uh, between the Z-score and the Frisk score is that the Frisk score really is a much more current model 
it handles the complex relationships between all of these various data sources, uh, as well as the nonlinear relationship between changes in specific inputs and the impact they have ultimately in uh, financial distress, the risk of financial distress. All right, thank you, Camillo. This question is for all the panelists. Uh, feel free to jump in on this one. At an entry level uh, of predictive analytics, what tools can an entry level person use? Excel, Access, et cetera. Well, uh, in, in uh, some of the services we provide, I mean, the, we have the uh, data available on our website. It's part of our offering, uh, so you can get access to uh, that information, and we have lots of tutorials on how to use and interpret that information. Okay. Yeah, yeah this is Brian. Uh, Excel is a great way to start. We actually have a, a product, uh, Forecast X Wizard, that does a lot of um, uh, forecasting right within the tool to help you build your process. And then you, from there, you can, there's a, our, our solutions will help you uh, take it to the next level, um, you know, around bringing in that information and doing that. Uh, even the, the, our Excel plugin has regression models that you can use to, to get you started and see how that works for you to, to build your budget on taking it to the next level. So um, it, from a, it's, you can make that transition transition to other systems and in and, and our system fairly easily. A lot of the challenge is that change management because of the uh, because of the black box. But we've seen, um, you know, with uh, definitely even the machine learning, just an improvement of of, of accuracy uh, on on their products that have been tremendous. Uh, Twenty percent improvements on accuracy in some cases. But uh, Excel is a great way to start. Usually, you're gonna our tool will help you um, get see that the next level, and start with. And then from there, it's it's about going to the system because a lot of what you're gonna want to do is get in information more frequently, and that's hard to do in Excel when you're trying to get real time or near real time data. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Vivek, are machine learning algorithms different from statistical algorithms? Um, they are indeed. Um, the mathematical foundations for statistical algorithms, that, that's been around for a long time. And as I think Brian pointed out as well, um, they are based on looking at history, looking at the variate, variability from actuals, uh, or, and, and also trying to find the best fit. Um, Brian even mentioned a few names, Holt, uh, Winters, and Moving Average, or Fox Jenkins and others. Um, the, the, these are static in their nature. What I mean by that is, you know, you feed data into it, you find the best fit for uh, what algorithm would be the closest to what the data set is, and based on that best fit, it would uh, use the mathematics to uh, come up with the predictive view. Machine learning, on the other hand, consumes a tremendous amount of data, and is much more dynamic. More data you feed it, more it learns from it, and more it evolves. And uh, you know there's two types. You know if there, you can do machine learning in a supervised environment. You can do what we call feature engineering, and uh, you know figure out the right labels, the right drivers, and uh, and you know figure out an algorithm. Let the machine figure out the algorithm that is closest to what you're trying to accomplish or predict. And the and there are many different uh, algorithms within the machine that, are, that have statistical foundations. And then the other types of algorithms, like neural networks, they call it, which is you know, finding all the cause and effect relationships in a network environment and let the machine try to decipher that based on the data that you feed into it. And uh, those tend to become what folks call deep learning. And then deep learning is actually much more complex and often very difficult to explain as to why the machine is predicting the way it's predicting. But on the other hand, they're fairly, very, very accurate. 
So, and there is a whole library of types of algorithms uh, that apply in different situations and depending on the types of uh, predictions that you try to come up with. So yes, short answer is very different from statistical an algorithms and of course much more accurate if, if used correctly and if the right data is set to the machine. All right, thank you, Vivek. Uh, Brian, can you speak for a moment about machine learning adoption? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the, especially when you're depending on the, the people in the organization, it's convincing them to, to use the results. And a lot of times you have people, sometimes you're working with people who have been around the business for a long time. And so it's working with them to say, we're going to look at this new path and and this is and this is the direction we're going to head, and then being able to show them the results. Sometimes it's about uh, showing results and showing what we can do, but the getting people on board is is going to be most important because when what they're going to be seeing out there in the field is going to make sure it is is going to be important. The people on the ground floor, when they can buy into hey, I understand that, that this is, uh, that we're using machine learning and that the machine is driving it. And then when I see issues, if I could bring it back to them so that they can, and they can do more and have you considered these things to look at it differently. And so to get their buy-in is absolutely uh, critical. And that's what we've noticed in our tool when people are using machine learning. It's, it's, it's one, figuring out the data and how to use it and, and manipulate that. But then it's also letting other people, you know, uh, understand that we're moving in this direction and helping them feel comfortable with those, with those results. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, Camilo, uh, you mentioned the Frisk score uses crowdsourcing. Does the Pace score use the same or a different method? Uh, no, the, the the Pace score does not use crowdsourcing. Uh, crowdsourcing really is. Uh, is uh, focused on the companies where we have a lot of subscribers interested in uh, the financial condition of that company. So for many private companies, we just don't have that uh, concentration. The, the PACE score uses a different technique. It's, uh, it's actually a deep learning algorithm uh, that uh, we built uh, that is driven off the trade payment information uh, that we receive from those subscribers who are credit managers uh, in their companies, uh, and also public information, for example, federal tax lien data, uh, events on federal open federal tax liens is another one of the inputs uh, there. So uh, we've, we've we've trained that uh, on historical information uh, and uh, trained it to to predict bankruptcy. All right. Thank you. Uh, obviously, uh, information is much more readily available for public companies. Um, this is a, a question to the panel. Um, how do we predict for private companies? Well, you, you're, you're much more limited uh, for uh, private companies in what information you can get. You know, if it's an important vendor, you may have leverage to obtain their financial statements. Uh, a lot of the times. They may not be uh, audited financial statements, uh, or they may be uh, highly simplified. So you're, you know, you're, you're somewhat limited there. Uh, but the type of information that uh, is most commonly available is really trade payment data, uh, which for private companies we find works very well. For public companies, however, trade payment data is actually not indicative of their financial condition. In fact, it can be misleading is what we find. Uh, a lot of public companies that have failed made their uh, you know, accounts payables on time, especially to critical suppliers. Uh, and uh, right up until the time they file for bankruptcy. So uh, we, our recommendation is always used, to, if you're dealing with a public company, use the wealth of data that's available out there. 
to come up with uh, that kind of uh, assessment. Thank you, Camilla. Thanks to our audience for joining us today. Any questions we were unable to answer during the live event will be addressed by the panelists via email. In addition, an archived version of today's event will be posted on SDCE's website at www.sdcexec.com. Thank you again to our panelists and sponsors, Camila Gomez, PhD, Senior Vice President, Quantitative Research for Credit Risk Monitor, Vivek Sanasia, Global Head of, of Supply Chain Solutions for Anaplan, and Brian Begeman, Leader at John Galt Solutions. This is John Yuva, Editor for Supply and Demand Chain Executive and Food Logistics. Have a great day.